Welcome to episode two of Wake Up the Echoes presented by Tyrac.com. I'm your host, Tony Simeone. So happy to have you back for our second episode of the season and glad to have those of you who are joining us for the very first time. We'll get a chance to talk to head coach Marcus Freeman, as we always do on this show. We also got a chance to talk to two wide receivers, veteran Chris Tyree and freshman Jaden Greathouse. We were also joined a little bit later by former Notre Dame student and current member of the Levitard show, Jessica Smetana, from her studio down in Miami to talk all things Notre Dame and talk about how good the vibes are around this team now that they're 3-0. But first, let's catch up with the head coach, Marcus Freeman. Okay, Coach, it's episode two of Wake Up the Echoes. Really glad to have you back. I'm excited to talk a bunch of football, excited to talk about what happened last week, but I think we got to start with today. Mm. Uh, I heard you in your press conference address it, and I was driving in uh, from from my house. I kind of forgot mm-hmm. that it was 9-11, uh, and it's been 22 years. Wow. And you're a couple years older than me, but mm-hmm. I was like in seventh grade yeah. when that happened. I was living in Seattle, so 3,000 miles away. And it's just hard to believe that it's been 22 years, yeah. and I heard you in the press conference say that you're going to give a history lesson because I imagine you coach a lot of kids mm-hmm. that were not alive when that happened. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on the top of the show. This will go out on the 12th, but obviously people were you know around yesterday on the 11th just to hear kind of what you reflected upon today and then what you were telling the team as it relates to, to 9-11. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I remember it as you did. Um, I was 10th grade and, and on 9-11, and – I remember the impact it had on me um, mm-hmm. that day. And, and again, I've always been raised to truly love and respect your country just because my father served. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this summer I went to New York City to do some media stuff. And um, the NFL Network, their building was right across the street from the 9 11 memorial. And I was with Katie Lonergan and I said, Hey, you think we have time to walk over there after we're done? And she said, Yeah. So we went over there and it kind of all hits you, right? You see the the actual places where the, the buildings were. Mm-hmm. And then you see how tall the new Twin Towers building is. And then to really kind of look at that and look at the names and think about the lives that were lost. To I remember leaving there walking like, man, so when the, the building came down, I wonder how much smoke. And, and it's just unimaginable at times. And it, and it kind of made an impact on me. And I want our players to understand, like, you weren't alive, most of you guys, yeah. when this happened, but this is something that truly changed our country. Yeah. And and I want them to kind of just understand the, the truly um, magnitude of that day and really the ripple effects it's caused for our country 22 years later. And so um, if we don't teach them, then who will? Yeah. Right? And so I want to make sure our kids understand that. Yeah, I, I was thinking about it and just it's – I feel like we're at an age where you can vividly remember the world before it yeah, and you can vividly remember the world after it. And I do think, and it's, it's great to hear that you have this perspective as a coach, like you seem to feel like you have the responsibility to educate them about what happened before with any topic that's of importance in right. American history, right? Like if you weren't around for this, we got to let you know why things are the way they are and to not take, you know, the freedom you have for granted. Because I just remember like when that happened, you kind of, we're in this bubble here, it feels like, and we're very safe and we're very lucky for that. It's pretty fragile, yeah. And and when you forget that it's fragile, that's when it's probably in in its most jeopardy. So I yeah. I just thought it was great to hear you say that, and I think obviously you would probably echo the sentiment that like anybody that was impacted by that, you know, our, our thoughts go out to them this day on 22 years later. It's, it's unbelievable. Okay, we are with Chris Tyree and the head coach Marcus Freeman. Let's just start with what you guys were talking about before we started rolling on these mics. I saw him trying to get the conversation in before we recorded, Coach. Yeah. Are you saying that we have an issue with Chris Tyree getting run down? He well, got caught. What happened? Here's let's I, perception, right? I I don't play. I'm I'm watching. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You it, know, I said, hey, how how did eleven catch you? Mm. You know, from NC State. Now he's fast. He's he's fast. Tobias can tell you he's fast because he caught Tobias. But you know, Tyree is arguably the fastest guy we have on our team. Mm-hmm. You know, and and um, that play where. He, got pushed out of bounds. He reestablished himself in bounds, which is really good. Mm-hmm. It, when he caught it, I'm like, Tyree, Chris is gone. Yeah. He's gone. But um, 11 got close enough. But he told me he didn't catch him. He told me he didn't catch him. So what happened, Chris? That's not what happened. Like he said before, <laughs> when he first started the conversation, um, it's it's all about angles and, and how deceiving In life. Is. In life, it's all about angles. It's all about <laughs> angles. But um, I was just telling him, like, I remember when I caught the ball, I saw him. Like, I deliberately looked back to see where he was um, just to make sure that he wouldn't catch up to me. 
Okay. So as I'm like keeping my stride, I can kind of feel him behind me. I know he's not catching up to me until I get to a point where there's like three or four defenders in front of me. There was two. I only saw two. Uh, was, maybe there was another one. Two. It might have been two. <laughs> we'll get the all 22 out and check. <laughs> but uh, it was, okay, let's say it's two. And, um, you know, I'm like slowing my speed down to try to set him up and cut back to the middle of the field. But as I'm cutting back, I turn around and spin and see 11 right behind me. But um, that was because I slowed down to set the defenders up in front of me. He did not catch mm. me. So he would not have caught him if there wasn't the two defenders in front of him. Now, it's funny because in my head – I was thinking, get out of bounds. Sideline, get out. Get out of bounds. Yeah. It's two minute. But then I hear Parker and Stucky saying, cut back, cut back, cut back. So I, we, we had, had time enough time. time yeah, out, we had yeah. enough time, you know. But uh, it was a great play, no matter what. I've got people telling me that the nickname is The Jet, though. Yeah, and, I got and, that around, like, middle school, seventh, eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Do you it think was, that your nickname's maybe hurting after you didn't get caught, but – or run down from behind a little bit? I don't, no. I don't think so. Okay, it's still no, safe inside the building? Yeah, he's good. Okay, <laughs> He's good. He's earned that right. <laughs> yeah. Coach, I wanted to ask you about his transition because I, I watch the games now, and it was less than a year ago, I think around spring game, he was going to move over the first time I saw him play a full-time receiver. I watch the games now, I don't even think it's a running back playing receiver. It's mm-hmm. just another receiver. Yeah. And I, how impressed have you been with the way he's transitioned and, and kind of what does that show the rest of the team about the way he's transitioned to? Well, I remember we had this conversation postseason, right? We used him last year, you know, out of the backfield, but also in some some passing situations out there um, as a wideout. But, you know, when we talked about it postseason with, with, with Coach Stuckey and Coach McCullough, like, hey, we're thinking about having a conversation with Chris to truly move him to be in a wideout. And in my head, I'm like, you guys got to really if, – if, if Chris thinks that's what's best for him mm-hmm. – then let's do it. But he's too good for us as a running back yeah. to go say, hey, we need you to to go play wide out. And I don't know why I was surprised when, when they came off and said, he's great, he wants to do it. He wants to do it. And to think about where he's at now versus where he was at in the start of spring, you were right. For In the start of spring, he was a running back that we moved to wide receiver. And where he's at now is he's a, a great – slot wide receiver for us and it speaks to the work ethic that he's had I, I see him work tirelessly at, at you know really enhancing his skill set as the wide out position and so yeah it's the ultimate sign of, of of unselfishness and unit strength but also I love the work he's put in to make himself a great player as a wide out I know you've put in a lot of work but I'm curious Chris I want to go back if you can just what are those discussions like because you came in here as a running back recruit you've been a great running back for this team you've had big plays throughout your career here and then someone says hey we need you to change positions or, or we want you to change positions like you said like how does that come up and then truly like what goes through your head what goes through your head when that comes to you and and an unexpected request is asked of you yeah um I could definitely say there was a lot going through my mind when mm-hmm. they first asked me about the about the switch but um you know, just being able to figure out what I want to do. Um, like, I, I want to play in the NFL, obviously. Right. And I think, um, you know, just with my skill sets, with my physical abilities, with my athletic abilities, I think it would be better fit for me to be a slot wide receiver. Yeah. So I figure why not try to, you know, experiment a little bit now in the spring, see how it goes. And then, um, you know, if it's not really what's best for me, and I'll just move back to, to running back, and then it is what it is. But, um you know, I think a lot of people were pleasantly surprised with how I progressed over the spring. Um, I think day one was a lot worse <laughs> than day fifteen for sure. But um, like he was Coach just Freeman on the bumpy saying, road. Yeah, you know, we talked about the yeah, bumpy. yeah, the he bumpy was just road. on the bumpy We've road. The bumpy road. road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's gonna be some bumps. Uh, what do you like about receiver? I like being in space. Mm-hmm. I like being able to work with so much space, making people miss even without the ball. Like, yeah. Um, you know, I take a lot of pride in that, and I'm. Constantly try to work at it each and and every day. One guy, I'm just curious because you play with him. Did you talk to Avery Davis at all about any of this? Just because, like, he he played, like, six positions while he was here. And I I just always thought, and Coach, you came when he was at the back end of his career. Like, I saw him come on this campus as a quarterback recruit. And then he was a DB and then running back and receiver. And he just seemed like the ultimate team guy. He would just do whatever was asked of him. Did you talk to him at all or anything? Take anything from him? No, not about the switch. But, um. One funny thing about that, I remember watching film with Audric, uh, it was like maybe a week or two ago, mm-hmm. and he's like, man, you kind of look like AD. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> but, um, you know, like the more we were watching it over and over again, it's, it's a weird resemblance. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about um, this guy to your right. Coach Freeman's now in his second year as a head coach, but third year on campus. 
What do you like about playing for Coach Freeman? Oh, man, don't do this right here in front of me. <laughs> man, um, one thing that I like is just the competitive uh, nature and environment that he brings to the okay. table every day. Um, that's something that, you know, I've had a lot growing up, like playing football. Mm. Um, you know, I had a team where we didn't even really, like, do drills. We just showed up, warmed up, and just scrimmaged every day. <laughs> Sounds kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really fun. Yeah. But, um, you know, just being able to have that competitive edge, um, mm. not being able to lose it, and then just – constantly being pushed each and every day is something that I appreciate and um you know I think I think it's something that's really special about our program I want to talk about Raleigh a little bit delay I mean it was like two hours right yeah what do you got tell me what the locker room is like for that delay what do you we talked last week about do you ever run out of things to say yeah did you run out of things to say yeah, last week? You had plenty to say and you just went to your own corner and yeah they don't want to hear from me during <laughs> a two-hour delay like the you know listen the the probably biggest um, over exaggeration is is the head coach is going to get you so fired up to go out and do some things in right before the game. You know that happens in practice. I, I try to say my most motivational talks for for practice days, days that these guys have class all day, days these guys are are tired. Like that's when we need them to go. They're ready to go in the game. And so, you know, you talk about we, we first thought it was going to be a 30-minute break. Right. So the players are kind of um, just hanging out, you know, in their position groups. And coaches went to the coaches' locker room and were talking and about adjustments. And then when we found out that it was going to be a longer delay, you know, it gave us, gave us an opportunity to kind of just get around our players, talk about any adjustments that we need to make from the first quarter. And then that was 30 minutes. And then you got another 30 minutes where they were kind of just leave them alone. Yeah. Let them go be with each other. And coaches kind of went to coach's locker room and relaxed and just just hung out. It yeah. was like a, a long pregame. Yeah. Right. That's what you do in a locker room on away games. Like you're sitting in a locker room like, when are we going to go out for warm ups? Right. And then the last 30 minutes we uh, we got going. But. You know, we fed them a lot of hot dogs, right? <laughs> so I've heard, so I've heard. I, I personally did not have a hot dog. Okay. Uh, we had wraps. Let's make sure. Yeah, we, I, 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 I yeah, there were plenty yeah, of wraps, but some wrap. people were opting for the optional. Yeah. Like if there's a yeah. chance to get I mean, the hot Is anybody yeah. surprised Audric had a hot dog? Like, <laughs> no, I mean, surprising. It's, it's, no surprise. It's, I mean, <laughs> JT might have had two. <laughs> yeah. What were you doing, Chris? As an older guy, were you feeling like you had to talk to guys or you guys just doing your own thing, just trying to pretend like nothing was happening? What was yeah, going on? It, it was weird because I had never been in a game like that yeah. before where there was a delay. Um, you know, just not knowing when we were going back, I actually took a nap for about 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, like, I had my towel over my head, I had my headphones in, and I was, like, actually, like, I had my eyes closed for a, f- yeah. for a bit. But, um, like you said, we were just spending time with each other, talking about the game, um, maybe or maybe not. Uh, tuning into some other games as well while okay. we're while we're sitting in the locker room, but um, yeah, we were just waiting to go back and play. Were either you guys surprised when the first play went for eighty yards from Audric? Were you guys expecting something big right out of the tunnel? Just thinking about how hyped up we were to go back <laughs> right before the game, like we were like in blasting music, yelling, <laughs> screaming before he even came in to talk. They to were, us. so yeah. we were ready to go. Yeah, it was weird because it was kind of quiet for the first hour and a half, you know, mm-hmm. and guys were just really just relaxing. And then right before I walked in there to address the team before we went out, I mean, they were going. I mean, they were yeah. They were in there jumping around, screaming. It was, I mean, I said, okay, this group's ready. You guys ready to go? Here we go. Let's yeah. roll. Yeah. You know, I don't need to say anything. These guys are ready and they're focused. And I just said, stay in the moment. Let's go back, go out to work. And uh, we drew it up perfectly. Here's your hot dog. Here's <laughs> 70 yards. Let's roll. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm thinking about the locker room now, and I was we were talking to Mike Golick last week, and he said he was he played here in 2012, and he yeah. said since he's left, he's been chasing the high that he gets from running out of the tunnel his whole life, and he's never come close. Like mm-hmm. he broadcasts, and he goes, he was at um the game last week or the other day, Alabama Texas. Mm-hmm. He was there, he's on the field, I think, doing mm-hmm. doing radio stuff. But he said it doesn't come close, and I'm just curious because you're in locker rooms now, you played in locker rooms, now you get to coach, and maybe it's a little mm-hmm. different, but like I've never been. But it looks like, and it sounds like, just one of the most incredible experiences to be in there and run out. Like, like can you describe it for me in any way? Like, what's the emotion going? I'll start with you, Chris. Like, that goes through your head when you get set to run out of this tunnel out yeah. here. Yeah. Um. Man, it's it's really hard to put it into words. Mm-hmm. But I would say, like, one thing that I constantly think about is like the work that I put in to get to this moment. Mm-hmm. Like, um. I would say it's a really proud moment every time. I don't think I'll ever like get tired of it just because it's it's so surreal. But um, 
yeah, just to keep it short, like just thinking about what I did, the sacrifices that other people made to get me here. So you reflect a little bit yeah, right before you go. For sure. That's neat. What about you? Now that you now that you're the coach, yeah. you run them out, you lead them out. Yeah. Is it different than when you were a player and what goes through your head? It's not. I think it's the same butterflies, which hmm. as, you, as you just said, Golik talked about. I don't know if you can ever reciprocate that. You know, I, I get butterflies when I watch my kids wrestle. I watch my kids play sports. I mean, it is gut wrenching, but <laughs> to run out with these guys, like it is, uh, it's hard to describe as Chris just said. Um, and then once you get to the sideline, you're good. You put your your headset on yeah. and open the helmet, and now we're ready to go. But that those moments building up to coming out of the locker room and running out on the field, man, it is uh, an undescribable feeling. But I love running out with these guys, mm-hmm. you know, and and that's that's what's special, man. You run out with a group of guys that work their tails off tirelessly. Um, they trust you as the head coach. Um, it is a uh, a privilege of a lifetime to do that. I'm just curious now that he's made this switch and he's got this full year at receiver. Just what are your hopes and and what do you look forward to seeing Chris do this year and then beyond whenever his time at Notre Dame is done? What excites you about Chris Tyree? Well, he's going to have a decision to make at the end of this season. Mm-hmm. Um, man, I would love to have him back for another year. <laughs> just putting in a plug, but you know, yeah, you come on back, he, you come uh, co-host <laughs> the show if you want. Yeah, <laughs> he is. Um, he's just done a great job and and. I want to see him continue to excel, right? And and I'm talking about as this season goes on, you know, it, it's it's such an unselfish position compared to running back. A lot of times you know when you're going to get the ball in mm-hmm. your hand. At receiver, you have to go as hard as you can, um, and you never know if you're going to be rewarded for yeah. that on every single play. And so um, he just keeps doing what he's doing. He's going to continue to get the rewards like he did last game. And I see his production continuing to raise too. And – uh um, he's a joy to be around. He's a great leader for our team. You know, he's a, he, and Chris doesn't speak a lot, you mm-hmm. know, but his actions, man. Yeah. This dude comes to practice every day, man, with a smile on his face um, and works tirelessly. And uh, he is a great leader for our group, man. He's a great example for the younger guys. And so uh, I just look forward to watching him continue to excel. All right, here we go, guys. Uh, it's this week's Yeti, coldest moment of the week. I've got Chris Tyree, Jaden Greathouse here. Guys, great win last week. I want to talk first about your plays, then we'll jump into some other stuff. Chris, talk me through. 65 yards. You guys are doing the two-minute drill. It seems like every week, two-minute drills is getting faster and you're using less timeouts. So just tell me through how that play came together and what you were thinking. Yeah, um, that play actually didn't work the way it was supposed to. <laughs> it didn't um, look like it. <laughs> you know, Coach Parker always talks about like making our plays work, and I think that was like a really good example of that um like I actually got thrown out of bounds like as I'm running my route and I'm like just trying my best to get back in bounds as fast as I can and then like as soon as I turn around I see Sam scrambling so I just like try to find open space and luckily he finds me sees me and throws me the ball and then um you know I'm just trying to get as many yards as I can as in a two-minute situation of course so um yeah, that's how my play went. When a pl- I want to know this. When a play breaks down, like how long does it take you to realize, okay, I got a freestyle here because this did not go according to plan? When do you break off? Like what goes yeah. through your head? Um, well, it's kind of new to me, just me being <laughs> right? a, a new receiver as well. <laughs> I think Jaden can talk to you uh, 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 a, a little bit more about that. But, um, you know, just being able to see Sam scrambling, getting out of the pocket, trying to make something uh, out of nothing, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we kind of got to do the same thing. We have rules to it, but – um, I don't really want to get into that, but um, okay, keep the secrets in house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of just finding the open space, mm-hmm. try, trying to uh, use the whole field. All right, Jaden, let's talk about your play. This is now three touchdowns in three weeks for you. <clears throat> getting used to getting in the end zone, but just talk me through your play. How'd you get open? How'd you make the catch? Um, I mean, it was just the look that we had been practicing all week. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had ran that plenty of times in practice, and you know they gave us the exact look that we were wanting, and we knew we were gonna dial it up, and I. Just, I didn't have to do anything different, you know. It was just Sam put a great ball on me, and, you know, I just had to secure the catch. Everything else was just, you know, what we had been doing. I'm curious about receivers. Maybe you'll have a better answer than Chris because he's new. But like you said, when you see the look, when you get to the line of scrimmage, like how excited do you get when you say, oh, they're in a situation where if we do everything the way we're supposed to, it's going to come to me. Like do you get really amped up when you know it's going to be likely coming to you? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I definitely say it. I I get a little bit excited just like, you know, knowing a big play is coming and mm-hmm. like, yeah, I got to make the most of it. Um but it all comes down to the preparation and you know, like 
you know, all week you prepare to mm-hmm. be in that situation. And so, you know, you know, you're finally in it and it's like, you know, I just have to resort back to my work, like, you know, just working at that every single day um, in the weight room, getting faster and stronger on the field, uh, making sharper cuts, things like that. Like it all, it all just uh, comes out in the game. And um, at the end of the day, you got to go make a play. Let me ask you this, because Chris is new to receiver. How do you think he's adjusting to the role as receiver? I know you're a young guy, but how do you think he's doing? I mean, I think he's doing as good of a job as anyone could transitioning into a new uh, position, just, you know, developing new tendencies that, like, you know, for me, it's interesting to see because, like, this is what I've been doing all my life. Right. And so um, to see CT really, like, mold into something that, Mm -hmm. you know, I've been practicing on all all my life, like, and route running, you know, things like that, just small little tendencies that, you know, we see and only real receivers notice. Yeah. And, you know, just like seeing him notice that too and working on his game every single day, just trying to, you know, push each other and push every, sing- every single player on the team just to be better and maximize the moment that we're in. Um, it really just helps us all come together even stronger. Chris, I'm curious because you've been here a while. You've seen a lot of guys come through it, and you've gone through it too. Are you surprised that Jaden's this successful this early? Not at all. Mm-hmm. No. Um, you know, I, I've had a lot of people ask me this question in like um, different interviews, but um, you know, just being able to see someone just like moving without the football, like yeah. even when we're doing like routes on air, things like that, you can tell that like he's really savvy with his routes, and um, you know, you can tell that he's really confident in his game and being able to show that when the ball is in there as well, like mm-hmm. going up to get it. Um, contested um, catches, contested balls, it's like his confidence is through the roof. I mean, he, he knows that he's going to come down with it. And, um, you know, having a receiver like that is really special. Have you learned anything from him, even though you're the, the older guy? Yeah. What, what's something you've learned? I've been really like a sponge, hmm. like in, in in terms of being new to the receiver room. Um, you know, like I'm constantly learning from everyone in that room. Yeah. But like um, – I would say Jaden is really good at his releases off the line of scrimmage. Hmm. Um, you know, when when we're going back, watching one-on-ones, even watching it live in person, yeah, it's like, it's hard to cover. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I kind of feel bad for the DB sometimes. <laughs> but it's uh, really fun to watch. What's it like to have Chris in the receiver's room? Because he's a veteran, and you guys, there's a lot of young guys in that room. So I imagine, even if it's not football stuff, like, what's the value of having someone that's kind of seen this place for a few years like Chris in that room with you guys? I mean... It's great, you know, from the start that I got here, you know, Coach Stuck w- uh, told me, you know, I was going to be one of our slot guys and I was going to be playing in the slot. And, you know, we've had plenty of older guys uh, mm-hmm. bouncing um, out of the slot position. You know, we have CT, we have Matthew Salerno, JT. Yeah. And we've had a ton of veteran guys uh, you know, be in the slot position and just being able to learn from each and every one of them uh, just like, how this college football stuff works, how I need to elevate my game yeah. and what I can do to get there. And, I mean, it's not even just the older guys. Like, you know, we got guys like Jordan Faison, um, yeah. who was a walk-on, came here, and um, all of a sudden, you know, he's third-string slot, and you know, I'm learning things from him every single day. Yeah. Um, and it's just all about building that connection um, and having that communication to be able to like see what somebody is doing, uh, be authentic with trying to help them and hmm. um, really just bettering ourselves every single day. What's something that the receiver room is talking about or focused on these days that's not football? What do you guys discuss? What are the things you guys are debating that you can share with us here? Changing our narrative, for sure. Hmm. I would definitely say that uh, changing the narrative that we have, that Notre Dame isn't just a run-heavy offense with great running backs and great O-line, but we have quarterback play and we have wide receivers that are going to make plays. And, you know, everybody feels it in the organization. Everybody feels it coming. And Coach Stuck talks about, um, you know, like, as we go, we all go. Hmm. And, uh, you know, like, as we're, you know, we get those quick little seven-yard completion, quick little – 15 yard completion now all of a sudden the offense is rolling and you know we're making plays CT, ct can attest to that chris yeah. i'm curious then with following up on that the narrative thing so you've been here now for four years do you, 
I get the sense that you guys feel like over the last few years, the discussion has been they don't have the receivers necessary to maybe go as deep as you want to go, and you guys are trying to prove that wrong. Is that kind of what I'm picking up on? Is that yeah. Right? Um, you know, since I've been here, I think I've definitely heard that narrative before, hmm. um, and it's something that I'm not saying that that's we're using it as our motivation, but, okay. you know, we kind of pay attention to it a little bit, just kind of using it as, as a little bit of a chip on our shoulder, yeah. just having some kind of um, motivation or, like I said before, like any kind of chip on our shoulder to, to, to play better. Um, I mean, he hit it on the nail for about like two or three minutes there. He took everything I was going to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> He's figuring it out. Uh, I'm curious because we were talking before we started about how you're getting your degree in December. Congratulations in advance, assuming it all goes according to plan. Thank you. Um, what, though, is some piece of advice you'd give Jaden for his next few years here to make sure? Because it flies by, right? I remember you, I was here when you came on as a freshman. I look, I can't believe you're wrapping up your degree. Like, what's the piece of advice you give him or young guys to make sure they do while they're here? It doesn't have to be football related. It could be academic. It could just be South Bend related. Like, yeah. what What would you tell him to make sure he does over the next few years here? Yeah. Um, one thing I would say is just, like, as your time here, well, throughout your time here, as you meet new people, see new things, travel to new places, like, don't take those relationships for granted. Like, you never know when you're going to have to reach out to somebody or, like, um, meet someone new where you get a new opportunity, things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, just to keep it short, like, don't take those relationships, like, those friendships. Don't take it for granted. Um, make sure that, you know, you keep in touch with your people, things like that. That's good advice. I wish I had that when I was in, in college as well. What's been the toughest uh, adjustment for you coming from high school to college? I mean, you've adjusted on the field pretty well, it seems, mm-hmm. but it could be off the field. What's the thing you've had to get used to the fastest? Um, I have a lot of free time, a lot more yep. free time than I was expecting. Um, and so just trying to figure out, you know, what to do with that free time and, you know, just maximizing uh, and just trying to get the best out of me mm-hmm. in those moments. Um so that I can so that I can set myself up for where I'm trying to go in, or trying to go, and uh, just trying to figure out how I can use that time mm-hmm. to get myself ahead. You know what I was doing with my free time in college? FIFA, FIFA, FIFA. Madden. I love FIFA. Yes, yeah, so are FIFA, you still playing yeah. FIFA then? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you can admit it. It's okay. But, but yeah, just trying to cut down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Just trying so. to find what the right amount of FIFA is. Yeah, exactly. It's um, a tough bat. My freshman year, like my grades reflected that because I was playing too much. <laughs> uh, I'll get you guys out of here. This last one, I want to hear from both of you. Pretty good start to the year, right? I mean, I, I'm flying pretty high watching you guys. I'm sure you guys are having a good time, but it's still early. Just what's kind of the discussion like around the building right now as you guys go into each week what's kind of your mindset as you get set obviously it's a big game this week but the schedule is going to really start heating up soon I'll start with you Jay and just like what are you guys trying to focus on here week in and week out um just maximizing our potential Hmm. each and every single day going out there um keeping our head down not looking at the clock just trying to make the best out of each moment that we're in so that way we can get to where we're going and do the things that we're trying to do. Chris? Yeah, um, just adding on to that, I think we're trying to make the most out of each and every day. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we understand there's a bigger picture there, but, you know, um, Coach Freeman always talks about how those 1%, like you get better, 1% better each and every day. So just trying to stack days together, um, you know, living in the moment, um, understanding that, you know, at the end of the day, we're we're the only group that we have, you know, we talked about other outside narratives before. Yeah. But like, those don't really control anything at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, just trying to make the most out of each and every day. Well, to your point, we're trying to get 1% better with this podcast every week. I think we achieved that. You can go tell Sam Hartman that you guys were 1% better than him last week. So <laughs> make sure you relay that to him. I okay. love him. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll All right, it appreciate it, guys. Thank yep. you. Appreciate it. Cool. Okay, it's our second week of Wake Up the Echoes. We have a very special guest, someone that I know Coach Freeman knows, Jessica Smetana. Is your, we want, should we start over? Let's just start. Oh, Sorry, we should, we I don't know. want to keep it in? You should have kept it. We that. can keep it in. Oh, oh boy. No. My microphone just... Tell Dan Levitard to get brain. a new uh, engineer. I know, I, yeah. and they shoved me in the green room. Do you see this background? <laughs> Please do not do anything inappropriate with my background right now. I think we were going to get... I thought we were going to get the real, the whole full shebang there, but I guess oh, not. Oh, me too. Me All too. Right. Well, not maybe, important enough for that yet. Maybe, maybe we'll keep this in. Who knows? But we're joined <laughs> by Jessica Smetana of Metal Arc Media, uh, Notre Dame grad, most importantly. She's joining us today. I know she has... Uh, 
a ton of questions for Coach Freeman. So I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you kind of spit. Go ahead. Well, thank you for having me on, Tony. Uh, it's good to see you again. But I do have a really important question because I heard that during Coach's press conference today, the hot dog narrative around the Audric <laughs> Estime 80-yard run got debunked, and I'm devastated. Oh. I thought – this man went into the locker room during the lightning postponement, ate a hot dog, came out, and ripped off an 80-yard run. But I'm being told you actually had a very sophisticated nutrition plan in place for the postponement. So tell me the truth. What happened? Hey, a wise man once told me never let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? So we should just go ahead and go along with this story that Audric came in. We didn't have any food, so we had to go stand in line at concession stand, got him a hot dog, and he ran an 80-yard touchdown. I like this, actually. The press conference is where the formal narrative That's can right. be handled, and this is where we can start all of our conspiracy theories this is a perfect space for conspiracy this is well, there's yeah. it, well here's the reality of it is that <laughs> we had all these great nutritional food like like we had chicken wraps and turkey wraps and healthy food and audrick says um i want one hot dog please and so he eats the hot dog and then he ends up running a 70 yard touchdown but that's the reality of it we had healthy food audrick Probably had a little bit of a healthy food and a hot dog. I'm now worried maybe his diet's <laughs> going to change before the game going forward now. <laughs> it's a balanced diet. Um, I'm wondering, Marcus, what is the the worst meal you ever ate before an athletic endeavor? Like, did you get 10 McChickens before a football practice at any point in your career? Oh, I'm, I'm sure I've eaten something unhealthy before, like high school. Like, in our college, I was pretty – you know, structured in terms of the things I ate. But in high school, I mean, you could eat. If you had $2, you were going to McDonald's and, and getting two things off the dollar menu. It is what it is. And so I don't want to think about what I ate back then, you know. Um, it never came out, I don't think. But, um, yeah, I probably wasn't the healthiest either back then. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it, it did remind me of my soccer career. I ate, like, a, an, a giant Cadoba quesadilla once before running around for 120 minutes. But that's a story for another day. I want to talk about <laughs> – the NC State game, because I was curious, going into the game, I think a lot of Notre Dame fans had rain delay PTSD from the last time they played at in, in Raleigh in 2016. Is that sort of recent history something that you're made aware of going into a week where, you know, maybe fans have a little bit of a sting thinking about a matchup? Yeah, we had uh, quite a few members of our staff that were here, the support staff that reminded me or told me about the 2016 game and I mean, it just sounded like we were playing football in a, a, a shallow lake is from what I hear, you know, and that's the, <laughs> the imagery they, they gave me <laughs> is that we're playing football like in a lake. But, um, yeah, we did. We did have a rain plan, you know, and, and, you know, it's part of like the wet ball plan. Like, is it truly just a rain plan or is it a delay? You know, we didn't know we were going to be delayed for two hours. And so we had to make sure that um, we had plans for both. And um, it was well executed by our staff. Mm. Was there any point where you were like, what if we don't finish this game and it ends a 3-0 win for us? Oh, a dub is a dub, <laughs> right? As long as we get a W, Jess. Is it true? I actually heard that they were saying they could start the game, restart it anytime before midnight. Did that ever come to yeah. you? Yeah, that's the ACC rules. Oh. Um, but no, they never, they they kind of said, hey, this sh this storm should be out should of here pass. in the next okay. hour and a half. And so well, first we thought, okay, 30 minute break. And then they came back and report, okay, it sounds like it's going to go until another hour or so. Mm -hmm. And so it was, again, that break, it's like, what do you do? All right, you got 30 minutes where you're sitting there like, okay, what are we going to – when are we getting back out there? Mm -hmm. Then you get 30 minutes to make some adjustments and talk about, you know, what happened in the first quarter. Then 30 minutes of – so when you get to the stadium, an away game, you really – like you have 45 minutes to just sit – like you sit there and you – you look around and, and you act like you're, you're game plan. You're really just like, come on, let's go and warm up. Let's get this game going. And so it was kind of like doing that all over again. Is there any point where you're making adjustments and then the delay keeps getting longer and you don't want to overload the players with yeah. too much information because yeah. then they're going to be just too much going on before they get back on the field? Absolutely. I told the coaching staff, make a couple adjustments and leave them alone. Mm -hmm. Leave them alone. Like, they don't want to just hang out with us. And then we probably don't want to sit in there for an hour and a half and hang out with them. Yeah, you know, yeah. give them their own time and um, let them just get, be in their modes. And coaches, we kind of went to the locker room. I wanted to lay down. Like, there was just so many people in there. And, uh, you know, yeah, we can't overload those guys, you know, because they're not going to retain all that information. How do you game plan for an opposing linebacker who runs like a 4-2-40? I mean – 
<laughs> that guy like, was really yeah, fast. Yeah. That dude could fly. And and Tyree doesn't want to admit it. Oh, but man. I really think he caught him. He caught him. I really yeah. We discussed this really. He got caught. I mean, he could fly. Like, I don't know where he's from, but that, that guy. <laughs> I knew going into the game he was a player. Like, you can see on film, like, 11, their linebacker's a dude. Yeah. And to see him live in the purse, like, he caught Tobias Merriweather. Like, he was – and he's a linebacker. Mm-hmm. Um, he is. A, he's a good player. He's a really good player. Mm. Early in the game, when maybe things aren't clicking so well, are you making adjustments, or were you like, "I'm gonna wait till halftime," or "I'm gonna wait and see what the weather does"? Or how do you decide when you're gonna start realizing, like, okay, something's not working. We have to kind of go back to the drawing board, look at what NC State's defense is doing, and yeah. readjust here. You do it every series, right? In between series, you're on the headsets, and we're making adjust. Hey, what did they do? Why weren't we success- successful on this play? So you basically you, you go over every single play during the series, okay. right? Why? So while the defense is on the field, the offense is going play by play. What happened on this play? Why did he get sacked? Who missed the block? Why did we not have a good play? And then you make your adjustments and you go. And then the next series, we went three and out again, right? <laughs> and um, so we said, okay, we got to make these adjustments. And then, um, and but that's how it is, man. Yeah. It's like in between series, that is such crucial time to make sure you're making those proper adjustments how much more comfortable are you doing that now just in year two compared to year one when you you know you're dc before now you're involved with everything how much more comfortable are you well i have to be comfortable letting our coordinators do their jobs jobs, right like because when the offense is on the field i need to be on the offensive headset and when the defense is on the field i got to be with the defense and so you know you got some tv timeouts where you can talk through some things hey guys what are we seeing we don't need to panic last year i would have panicked like last year like I would have been yelling, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What's going on? Fix it. Well, that's obvious. Like, like you're just repeating things like that, that everybody Fix knows, it. right? Good... Hey, get it fixed. <laughs> uh, yeah, coach, duh. Like, what's what we're trying to do? Um, so the ability to kind of just stay calm and say, hey, what's okay. going on? What are we seeing? Are we good? You know, any changes we need to make? And then I let them kind of get to work. Yeah. 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 Likewise, when you're in the middle of a – defensive series and players are making some mistakes there's some penalty flags but they're still out on the field what do you do in that situation when nc state's offense can't get off the field um yeah you know i think about the ben morrison play and one that's just so uncharacteristic of ben Mm -hmm. then i kind of look at mick who's coach mickens mike mickens and i'm like What's he doing? Like, <laughs> what is wrong with Ben? Why did he do that? And it's a great reminder. Hey, write it down. We'll go address it when he when he yeah. gets off the field. But you can't fix it right there in the middle of the play. You just got to write it down and make sure we address it. You know, enhance the face. Uh, I I just wanted to argue with the ref a little bit and sure. say I don't agree with it. And then we had a defensive holding. So just again, it was a snowball effect that we got to say, hey, let's not beat Notre Dame. Get them mm-hmm. to the sidelines. Don't beat Notre Dame. We can't have three penalties on a drive because it's going to equal seven points. And so settle down focus on the things that matter Mm. okay last question because I know you have to go um you have a very busy schedule but (laughs) aside from like oh the fans what what do you look forward the most about coming back to play at home after being on a road trip you can't say the fans though yeah okay other than the fans Mm. you know Mm. I just you just love our home game routines right you love staying in a hotel that you have comfort with that routine, the going to mass in the Basilica, the the pregame walk over to the stadium. I mean, there's that level of comfort of being home, you know, and then playing at Notre Dame Stadium, there's nothing like it. Yeah. But that's what you love is that you're not in a foreign territory. You know, you go sometimes these way games, you don't know where to go, where to turn, where's our meeting rooms, what time are we leaving, and then you get lost sometimes. Yeah. But at home, you have a routine and you have a comfort level. If there was a weather delay at Notre Dame Stadium, there would have been a lot more comfort in that weather delay, I'm sure. We talked about that. We we got to see the rules and things because, like, are we allowed to go back to the, the Goog? Yeah. Are we allowed to go and have a walkthrough in the That's IAC? Like, there's obviously some some benefits of being home during a delay. Yeah. But I don't – we're not 100% sure on the rules. Like, can we actually leave the stadium and go and have a walkthrough? Interesting. You go know, to the dining so. hall. That's right. Yeah. You know, we should go have a party. Let's go, you know. <laughs> Depending on how long that break is, we'll see. I hope we don't hit a big weather delay like that this year, but I'm glad that you guys are on top of it so that if yeah. we do, we'll have a game plan to uh, maximize its potential whenever it happens. That's right. Make sure we have a couple hot dogs. <laughs> oh, many, plenty of hot dogs. <laughs> Coach, thank you. Jess, stay right here. We're going to keep talking after we let Coach Ruman get out of here. All right. Thank you, guys. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Enjoy Miami. <laughs> oh, oh I... my God. Get that thing <laughs> fixed, please. Okay. 
Okay, Jess, it's just me and you now. Coach Freeman has left us. He has much more important things to do than gossip about Notre Dame football. Uh, I want to talk to you now that he's gone about where you think this team stacks up. I asked Mike Golick this question last week. I'm pretty curious about it now that another impressive win is under their belt, 45 more points. How good is this team now compared to how good you thought they were going to be coming into the season? And just tell me, like, where is your excitement level? Because I know you are very passionate about this team, and I have to imagine at this point you're pretty excited. Yeah, I am extremely passionate about Notre Dame football and also very – I like to hedge a lot um, because you never (laughs) want to be the guy who's like, yeah, we're going to win it all, and then you have a bummer of a year, and then you're like, ah, crap. Because then no one believes you the next time. You don't want to be the college football analyst who cries wolf, right? (laughs) you got to save those bullets till you know you've got a really good team that you could get behind, especially nationally because the national media – does not like Notre Dame fans. They don't like when we're loud and annoying. They try to (laughs) shut me up constantly. So that being said, I think it's easier to answer that question this week versus last week because now we've seen Notre Dame play against an ACC school that has a usually a solid, you know, they're an eight and four, seven and five, nine and three team with Dave Doran. They're very solid NC State. So the fact that they went in there and won 45, we'll say 45 to 17, because like garbage time touchdown. We don't count the last score, score, yeah. We don't count that. Yeah. So it make it gives me it gives me a really positive feeling. I think you know everyone is looking ahead to the Ohio State game. That's mm-hmm. when you will really see how they stack up against a probably top three team right now in college football. But I think you can say pretty confidently Notre Dame's a top ten team. Mm-hmm. Um, looking around over the first two and a half ish weeks, if you include week zero. I think there's a lot of really, really good teams in college football. I think Notre Dame is one of them. Um, There's a handful of maybe great teams, and those are the ones that separate themselves down the stretch that make the playoff, that win a national championship. So I think Notre Dame's solidly in the good category, and I feel much better about certain position groups now than I did going into the season where there might have been some question marks. So Notre Dame is solidly good, and we're hoping that they become great. Really uh, good. Okay. Re- they're very good. G- good and can Not be great. Not just good. Can Not be great. Good. Can be great? Can be great. Can be I, great. Yes. I think the nice thing about the schedule this year, they have, I think they always play a great schedule, but this year, just the way it's laid out, if they take if they win every game, they're obviously going to be maybe at the top of the CFP rankings. Like It's all right there in front of them. There's great opponents. I, I can't wait to see them really play some of the, the top-tier opponents on this schedule. I want to kind of ask you the same question, though, about Sam Hartman. Because to me, I guess I had maybe similar questions or just wasn't sure until we saw him on the field. And then again, this past week, like you said, playing against a pretty good defense. The last time, actually, I think they gave up 30 points was to Sam Hartman when he was at Wake, which was crazy. Yeah, that was a crazy stat that Notre Dame Notre Dame broke a 30-point or less uh, streak by NC State's defense. Yeah, he just seems like the real deal to me. Ten touchdowns, no picks. Like, How excited are you about Sam Hartman? And is he maybe even a little bit better than you thought he'd be coming into this year? I, to be fair to Sam Hartman, I okay. thought he would be very, very good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so far he has met those very high expectations. So that's great. I think the thing that has been the biggest revelation is watching him in the two minute drill, hmm. watching him in the last couple minutes before the half, watching the way Marcus Freeman has responded to his talent level, made sure Notre Dame has timeouts on offense. They're able to drive the ball down the field under a time crunch. That's where you see the level of experience that Sam Hartman has in college football really shine. And that's something that you can't take for granted. It's something that, you know, really talented young quarterbacks can do it, but it's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. When you've done it a bunch of times, he almost makes it look easy and it's not easy. What's your uh, impression of Coach Freeman? We just talked to him, obviously, but... To me, this is like one of the hardest, if not the hardest jobs in college football. There's just so much scrutiny on the head coach at Notre Dame, uh, and for good reason. And, and uh, I have a unique standpoint because I get to talk to him every week about what it's like to be yeah, the head coach. <laughs> yeah, lucky me. Um, but you get to cover football and sports on a national level, so I think you maybe have a better perspective of just how it, this job stacks up against other jobs. But now he's in year two. You're, of course, a passionate Notre Dame fan. Like, What are your impressions of Marcus Freeman Uh, as he kind of starts year two off on the perfect foot. Yeah, well, so far, so good this season. I think one thing that I appreciate about Marcus Freeman is that he seems cool as a cucumber often, which is a really important quality because it's a long season. Like, you don't want things to get off the rails early. And I think in, in year one, that was the big test, right? Early in the season, Notre Dame struggled a lot. Lost to Ohio State, 
brutal home loss to Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Even the Cal game, the vibes were really bad. And like they, they didn't finish perfectly. They dropped a game at home to Stanford, but they still beat the crap out of Clemson at home. And they didn't give up, made it to a pretty good bowl game, won the bowl game. Like those types of things, as we've seen in, in years past with Notre Dame, like the season can fall off the rails very quickly. And I get the sense that all of the players on this team really, really want to play hard for Marcus Freeman and really appreciate the level of um, like professionalism and coolness that he brings to practices and to games. Um, so I hope it continues because right now, like you said, the vibes are so good. Being 3-0 and is awesome. I know he has one of the most high-pressure jobs in the universe, and he seems <laughs> that he, he seems to be handling it very well. It, it, it's 3-0, and and like I think the average score is 47-10 to 10 right now. So as you yeah, said, like the, yeah, the vibes are truly immaculate. Um, I'm curious about you and your background because there's people listening that probably don't know exactly, you know, who you are necessarily or how you are related to Notre Dame. I know we did the show about, what, four years ago with NBC where we got, I think, some great photos up there maybe, even of you at an early age coming to a Notre Dame game. So just for those that might not know your Irish history, why don't you lay it out for how you ended up becoming a Notre Dame fan and then ultimately uh, made your way to South Bend? Yeah, so my parents uh, both graduated from Notre Dame, class of 82, and I grew up just outside of Chicago. So I was very lucky <laughs> that when I was very young, my parents um, used to take my sister and I to Notre Dame games every fall, um, probably from the time I was I was truly a newborn. Like, I was born in May in 94. I probably went to games in the fall of 94 um, with my parents. I remember, like, there's tons of pictures of me passed out asleep in the stands of the stadium um, as like a four-year-old. So I've been going to Notre Dame games for as long as I can, can remember. People always ask me what my earliest Notre Dame football memory is, and mm. I truly don't. I don't know. I don't have one. <laughs> like they're all they all kind of blend together before you turn five, I think. So I was very lucky that that was something that I got to do from an early age. And then I ended up, my sister ended up going to Notre Dame. I ended up going to Notre Dame. Um, so I've, I've pretty much been a fan my entire life. Now I work in sports media for Metal Arc Media and the Dan Lebitard Show. Uh, and I host a DraftKings sports uh, podcast with Mike Golick, who we all know is a a very <laughs> famous Notre Dame grad, one of the best uh, radio personalities in history. So I'm very fortunate that I get to record a show with him every week too. Um, and yeah, I try to I try to inject some Notre Dame positivity into the Levitard show down here, but they're big Miami fans. Yeah, and it's very difficult. That's a that's an uncomfortable relationship between Miami and Notre Dame, isn't it? <laughs> it's extremely uncomfortable. They bring up 2017 often, ah. and I just I, I tell them you're welcome. Yeah, who Sold cares? Sold out your stadium, and it hasn't happened since. Yeah, who cares about that? Uh, I'm curious about uh, do we talk about your Clemson stint, or we don't we don't talk about that anymore? What 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 happened when you? <laughs> yeah. So I went to Clemson my freshman year, and then I transferred <laughs> to Notre Dame. And let me be honest, it was fun being a Clemson fan while they were on their national championship runs in, in 16 and 18. It was fun watching them beat the crap out of Alabama in the national championship. It kind of gave me some, like, <laughs> weird karmic retribution for 2012. Like, I've, I just felt good watching Nick Saban <laughs> lose. Um, but I'm not – now that Clemson and Notre Dame have played each other – three or four times in the last few years. And they played each other my senior year at Notre Dame too in 2015. That was the big hurricane game. Yeah. The once in a century rainstorm uh, at Clemson. I was rooting for Notre Dame. I was not rooting for Clemson. I've always rooted for Notre Dame in those matchups. Um, I had a soft spot for Clemson for a while, but now everyone I know has graduated and I've, I've kind of, I've, I've, I've graduated also from that period in my fandom, I think. I'm declaring that now. Actually, I've never told anyone that before. Okay, wow. That's so exactly. that's that's breaking news here. You've officially declared <laughs> that that's in the rearview mirror. I, I love to hear that. Okay, so Jess, I also wanted to ask you about your career path because I assume we have some people that will be listening that might be young college students or people that want to go on to Notre Dame and maybe study a career path like the one you have found yourself in. We talked about this when you're on a show years ago, and then I, of course, worked with you on that NBC second screen game. Uh, but it's been fun to kind of see you progress throughout your career. So I guess I'm just curious if you can lay out kind of how you got to where you are working for uh, such a big show like the Levitard show uh, and, and how you've kind of navigated your way through a really unique sports broadcasting uh, environment. Yeah, well, major credit to Fighting Irish Media. I gotta <laughs> gotta give it to them. Got a lot of experience when I was still in school working uh, hockey games and lacrosse games and soccer games. So I got a job right out of college at SB Nation 
noted Notre Dame haters. That was uh, <laughs> a brutal two years of of um, abuse and also coincided with a, a rough Notre Dame season, <laughs> uh, my first year there in 2016. But um, then I ended up working at Sports Illustrated, did every job imaginable there, podcasting, video producing, writing, uh, wrote for the magazine, all that fun stuff. Um, and like two and a half years ago, the executive producer at the Levitard show called me and asked if I wanted to move down to Miami and work on this show. And I said, yes. And so here I am. But, um, my origin story is like doing 55 different jobs for a couple different media companies right out of college. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the way to do it. I think for everybody that I've talked to, um, yeah. okay. I need to ask <laughs> you the question. Useful. <laughs> <laughs> I need to ask you the question that we are asking every former Notre Dame student that comes on this show to put their flag in, in one corner or the other. I need to know, don't be biased by anything. Just give me the truth in your eyes, North or South dining hall. I was always a South girly. I like North. I, when I, I grew up very uh, lucky to get to go to Notre Dame soccer camps every summer. And we would always go to North and I would eat a piece of cherry pie before every <laughs> single practice and it was probably terrible for me, but I played great. It worked. So I have a soft spot for North in my heart. All those cherry pies when I was a young child. But when I was at school, I, I only went to South. It's just more aesthetically pleasing. It's just a better dining experience. Mm. I love the high ceilings. I feel like I'm mm. at Hogwarts. It was just a very aesthetically pleasing dining experience. And the food was also really good. I want to say I respect your opinion and the most obvious flaw in the de in the debate or in your argument is that you just leaned on I liked what it looked like and felt like I heard very little about the better food or the better logistics I like to look at the stained glass I like the tall ceilings no talk to me about food and the way it's structured and just general meal enjoyment not just you looking eat with at stained your glass. eyes first tell me <laughs> so ambiance is important okay okay um I remember the omelet Bef whatever make your own omelet <laughs> station whatever it's called i remember the soft serve i remember mm. making my own pizzas everything was delicious i ate seconds and thirds every time i went to the dining hall it was the best and i, ho I hope that's a good enough answer for you those all sound like honest. things you can do at north but again as i said i respect your decision even if it's uh, one i don't agree with but north is like where even is north who who goes there <laughs> Why would you ever venture to that part of campus if it's you're great. not living in that immediate vicinity? Just stretch I your legs, never. explore what a beautiful Notre Dame campus is. Also, confession: I went to the library like three times while I was a student. <laughs> don't don't tell I your never parents studied that. Studied in the library. <laughs> it doesn't matter. All right, I ended up graduating cum laude anyways. Humble brag. Oh wow! Did not realize you're getting a resume uh, topper on top of that as well. <laughs> Library's overrated. Study at home. <laughs> Okay, last question I'll get you out of here with is our From the Irish segment presented by Tyrac.com. We always get uh, a listener submitted question. It's kind of my favorite part of this whole show. Here we go. It's from Nathan in Easley, South Carolina. Great question for you, Jess. Choose three current Notre Dame players to have on your team during a zombie apocalypse. Go Irish. That's a good question. I feel like Nathan from Easley is either going to love my Clemson answer or hate my Clemson answer. He's either a fan or a hater. Easley is like 15 minutes from Clemson. Right. Um, I think I have to pick Sam Hartman because I heard he can fish. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you can confirm that, but I remember some banter with him and Marcus Freeman about uh, fishing this summer. Yes. And I feel like in a zombie apocalypse, you need a source of food. Um, so someone who can fish and provide you know, some some sort of meal is is a good thing to have around i was trying to think off the top of my head if if we have any like pre-med or you know pre pre-professional science majors or biology i'm majors sure there's the someone team. yeah <laughs> yeah someone who could administer antibiotics in a zombie apocalypse <laughs> if i if i'm injured um i'm thinking kind of like a, a last of us situation if you watch that show on hbo um off the top of my head can't think of anyone so i'm gonna go with both of our left tack or our left tackle and our right tackle both of the tackles i just think having large people around who know how to throw a block probably good to have in a zombie apocalypse so you're going all so offense me, all me, offense joe alt <laughs> sam hartman and blake fisher is my answer wow okay defense might have a bone to pick with that answer but i i, I have a tough time picking a, a hole in that one because i think it's a pretty safe bet with those three 
I don't know. I mean, like, I could see an argument for almost any linebacker, D lineman, even a cornerback. Give yeah. me a speedy guy who yeah. can throw throw people out of the way, throw zombies out of the way yeah. from my path. I'll take it. Consolation vote maybe goes to Bertrand, Kaiser, and Leah Fow. Just take the three linebackers, and you're, and you're in good hands, too. I would in a heartbeat. Also, yeah. I was thinking Estime just because I would like to hang out with him. He seems like a great guy. He <laughs> makes me laugh. If you're gonna if you're gonna have the end of the world, Odric's probably a good guy to have around you while while it all goes to black. I would just love to, to hang out with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Eat a few hot dogs and watch the sunset. Um, all right, Jess, thank you so much for being our second ever guest on Wake Up the Echoes. Uh, you can all, always find her on the Lebetard Show and all those other great uh, Metal Arc properties. Thanks so much for covering Notre Dame the way you do, uh, and looking forward to having you on campus here soon. Thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun. Go Irish. That does it for this week's edition of Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com. Thank you so much to Jaden Greathouse, Chris Tyree, and Jessica Smetana. Please make sure to download, subscribe, and smash that like button if you're watching on YouTube. We'll see you next week for Episode 3 of Wake Up the Echoes presented by TireRack.com.